on to the second iteration of uh, our community interviews. This year, we have three um, First Nation band members, Elizabeth Dockstader from Six Nations of the Grand River. We have Karen Foster from Georgina Island. And we have Glenna Bocash from Nipissing First Nation talking about the importance of partnerships and alliances and what that means to our communities. So Chimmy Gwetch to everyone for taking the time to join us for the 23rd annual First Nation Public Library Week. My name is Elizabeth Dockstader and I was born and raised on the Six Nations Indian Reserve number 40 Grand River Territory. Uh, my name is Karen Foster and I'm retired. I was the uh, librarian for the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation for almost 20 years. And then after that, I did still work with them, but from home because of COVID. Uh, we've had a, we've got a beautiful community on the lake and I'm in my retirement. I just enjoy reading and I have some chipmunks I feed every morning. And uh, the community is wonderful at getting together to help everyone else. Miigwech. Anin Bojo, he's got to quit Dungeon Cause, Jag Nasham Win Nose Win Glenna, Shagado Dem, the Bissing Skungining Donjaba. So, my my clan is the uh, Crane, and I come from land set aside for the Nipissings under the treaty. So, I am um, right now retired but working. For, I left Nipissing First Nation in January as a retired culture and heritage manager. Where I worked as a librarian five years uh, for five years prior to that, and we actually morphed it into a culture center because all of my all the programming under my uh, as I worked, I I pushed it towards culture, like the Ojibwe literacy, and uh, heritage that came from Nipissing, not from mainstream. So it kind of went, it kind of morphed that way on its own. Um, I have uh, I'm the mother of four children. The oldest uh, I have. Four boys and my youngest is a girl and now 11 grandchildren the oldest is 23 and the younger two are one so it's a wide wild wide range of experiences for me there and spending time with them I'm close to all of them I'm a lifelong resident of Nipissing I've never left the reserve I just went to Nipissing University for education and um, my interest in here here is a community development, developing our community. I'm not an academic, I'm more of a community development person. And I give my volunteer and free time to try and anything to do de de develop our community in a positive way. And I thought being a librarian would help with that, carrying, being the uh, knowledge keepers. Our library did a lot of different collaborations with uh, libraries on the mainland. Um, we did one with Georgina Public Library and uh, they would come to the island and uh, come to the library and see everything. And the collaboration was important because they helped our library by um, seeing that what our needs were at the library and they would help by giving us stuff that we needed and in return during first nation public library week my colleague and i would go to their library their main library and hold a beating session and an information session about the island and the life on the island and it was amazing that um we were going to keswick which is about 20 minutes away from the island and none of them were even aware that there was a, a reserve there, that we were over there. And some of the kids were asking questions like, what kind of houses do you live in? What kind of food do you eat? And I said, pretty much the same as what everybody else does. It was a way for us to forge a partnership with them. And it uh, helped the awareness of who we were as a people 
on an island that was only 20 minutes away from them and they were they didn't even know about so that was a great collaboration to be able to share our culture with them and in return they shared with us any resources or anything else they were always contacting us if they found any historical artifacts that would pertain to the island so we maintained a constant relationship with the library and I found that was very important and they also allowed our uh, members to go to their library and have a library card and check out books free of charge like there was no membership fees or anything it was just if you were from Georgina Island and you wanted to belong to their library no problem here's a card take what you need so I found that was very important to share our culture and they shared with us. And that's, a, I think, a good partnership and a part of, uh, you know, our philosophy of sharing with other people. So when I was a librarian, we have the same uh, group of children. Our reserve has seven communities. We have to, we have to run a span of 40 kilometers along the north shore of Lake Nipissing. And we have to spread our programming out different places. But uh, as a librarian, I partnered with the Native Child Welfare here for programming. We would host programming for kids, put our resources together for like money and, and uh, supplies and deal and have the same, make a bigger event, maybe three times a week with with children. We always had them busy. And I'll tell you something funny. I had a partnership with Mary Fraser one time from uh, Whitefish Lake Library. This is funny. She we had a we had challenged our our boys challenge there to a hockey team a hockey game. She brought her hockey team down from Whitefish and played interesting here. We had referees and everything. We just we almost made like two library hockey teams. It's quite unique. It's funny, but it was really fun. And when they taught about hockey and stuff, but it was really really something. And we partnered with the education department for adult um, adult uh, education at night. So we partnered. We partnered with other groups because let's say you're going to have a Halloween event or something. So we got together and just all put our resources and have made it bigger and better. Instead of every department doing little things, we had one. So I found that really helpful how we got together. And finally, we went to the, we made an integrated children's program. So the education did the after school homework program. Recreation put a little gym night during that time. And we had opened the library for other things. So it all collaborated. It helped with after, after child care after hours and helping with homework, but recreation until people finished work. And one more I'll mention is, <laughs> I had this dream uh, working as a librarian, starting with the fact that we were supposed to be keepers of our history and there was none anywhere. There was nothing recorded. So I applied for a grant. I wanted to start writing a book called the Nipis about Lake Nipissing. And we're 10 years later now and it's going to the publisher to Winnipeg Press. It's about the lake. And the more things we uncovered, it got stronger and we, it's built on, um, it's it's built on uh, interviews and archival material and old documents we found. It's it's going to it's really grown, and uh, during this time, we built a partnership with Nipissing University. Their historian researcher professor approached me if they can help because she is an author also. So that. So I, I was I was the one that had the information, knew who the people were, and knew where the stories were, and she was the academic author, researcher, and so she sources everything. So now we're together. You know, I mean, it's it's so exciting that book is going to publish just from that dream of being a librarian, starting with not having any history. I think that's pretty. Uh, I could I still can't believe it's happening. It's um, oh, it's it's really going to be a good book, and um. Also, the Lake Nipissing Beating Project is another collaboration. We we works. I still work um, with the Heritage Center, as um. So we we our people beaded squares, and you can you can Google it if you want to. 
Lake Nipissing Beating Project, and it's, it works with Dokis and Nipissing University again. And people applied for squares, and now the whole we have a replica of the whole Lake Nipissing beaded. You have to just check that out. It's a, it's going to be, it's at it's been at the museums in Sault Ste. Marie, Thunder Bay, Dokis, and it's going to Timmins this week. So the power of collaboration to me is everything. People pooling their resources and ideas, and the more the merrier. It, it's very inclusive. Partnerships are inclusive of everybody. So I love them. Collaboration. Uh, it's kind of a a big term. Uh, I would say that uh, a, a lot of things happen in our community where all ages are involved. And when I was working off the reserve and, and talking to people who um, were uh, treaty come, come from treaty partner communities, they were actually surprised that we could blend ages together to have some kind of like event happen. Uh, there wasn't that that cutting off of like categorizing people by age or gender or anything like that. It was not what you couldn't do, it was based on what you could do, what you had to offer to the whole group. And so I think that uh, for a long time, people were stuck on this term, uh, decolonize. And it says what you don't, we, what we don't want to do, or what we don't want to have, or we don't want to have limit us anymore, uh, as opposed to a more of a concept of revillagizing, where we return to that mindset of when our people lived in villages and it was interdependent and um, it, everything was always collaborated. So I think that changes that mindset from um, something that it's almost like changing it from a deficit uh, perspective to really uh, a healing perspective to what we were deprived of for several generations. <laughs>we didn't have our stories what would we be so the, the that um place in a community uh especially when so many families have been deprived of uh, stories and and understanding our culture and also the history that we come from that uh there's a, a sacredness that's attached to that role i think the uh, it, it's kind of if we go back to the um, understanding that uh, every child was raised with everyone watching them to help identify their gifts and guide them and support them so that they would have something very valuable to offer the, the village. And so if you think of a library and a librarian and those kinds of roles, it's like uh, storytellers and people that um, value those stories would have been very important and still are because our stories are carve out the definition of who we are. If we didn't have our stories, what would we be? We have on the island something called joint services. And it was all the programs on the island, health, the police. And we would meet once a month and discuss everything that was going on the com in, within the community and uh, where some people might need help or what pro programs we were offering at the library, what programs were at the health center. And it gave a wider uh, picture of everything going on within our community. So we would host gatherings like um, pancake breakfasts, um, all different types of things to get the community together and share different things like uh, there was, uh, what was that called? I forget what it was, but it was one uh, day, oh, the winter carnival. So all the groups would get together. Um, the funding would come from whatever group and we put on a winter carnival for the entire community, which started off with a big breakfast and it would have a poker run uh, and then it would be games and skating at our rink because we have our own rink there for the kids and tug of wars and all kinds of different things. And it brought the community together. So it was like all the programs working together to bring the community together 
to have an enjoyable time and to keep people up to date. So if we were having a program at the library, then that would go out across the community in all different ways so that people would be able to gather there. I think being active like a, as a as a librarian taking it taking it beyond your borders. So we joined with a group in North Bay called the Blue Sky Region Network. That was a collaboration all the all the libraries in the Blue Sky Region again pooling our resources and um and they would have access to grants and things that we could apply for such as there used to be the CAP the CAP, you might remember that Karen the CAP program where you hire a student and they provide the library open at night with some, um, then they could help computer help and things, assistive devices and programming. So just being active, not being idle and sitting alone, joining, going past those board and joining those things and joining like, like Karen did the committees in your, in your community. We joined the elders committee and we went and helped them with uh, learning how to be older, like really older people and going to their events and helping them put on a... So Library Week would include them. We're going to have something for you. We're going to have something for the daycare. We're going to have an, a program for, um, I don't know, technology. It's just being so varied in what you do. We even had canning, like learning without books, how to... We went and got a bunch of food. We taught them how to can fish suckers from like different things, how to use coarse fish and how to respect those fish that are overlooked. I know there's so many ways and just like I said, just being um going to the the going to those conferences like the one in Toronto, the big one, putting yourself out and you meet you make more connections there. I met authors there that I invited here after. Just being active. You have to really be driven and active and have your community at heart. And I remember reading that being told when I started as a librarian. Your library becomes the light living room of your community, the hub. And I took that to heart. So we opened it up to bring your children. We made a, a playroom. Um, we bought East Link. You know, there's a computers there. There's books. So just being a hub and inviting the people to the living room. Just going out and out, outreach. That's the word I was looking for. Outreaching. And like joining so many joining so many things and coming back with new things, new ideas. Even that one agreement we had with the university at Nipsey University was a PALS. So we shared, they were allowed to bring their, their library card here and we were allowed, our community was allowed to go use their library, their extensive library using our card because of that agreement. Yeah, there's just a million ways. When you sit there and think you almost overrun yourself because there's so many possibilities just to keep active and in, informed even with hockeys even with hockey teams <laughs>
when we heard some of it being spoken in private. So it was a great idea and to have that within our community, because as I say, um, our language is dying on the island because of the fact that we are losing our speakers, our fluent speakers. I think there's maybe two people left that are totally fluent. So having programs like that to have them come in to the library where they're comfortable and just have like a social and speak it and hear it being spoke makes a big difference. So that's all I can say about um, collaborating with language within the library. I um, started having Ojibwe literacy in our, well, yeah, Ojibwe literacy in our class, in our library, because English literacy was everywhere already. It's on TV, it's in mainstream, it's mag all the magazines. So when I talked to my CEO, I said, I'm going to do, we're going to do our literacy here and our history, because that's what we don't have. And I remember my first grant came from the Aboriginal Sweetgrass, Aboriginal Language Foundation or something, initiative, ALI. And it started with simple classes. I was doing a testing to see who wants to learn. And I did a survey. And 99% people said we want to learn it. And I wanted to test it. Okay, let's see how committed we are. So it went good for a while. Then it, I'm happy to say that now it's it's in full force. And we'd have monthly socials with our speakers where we opened it up to the community. We called them Nishnabe and went socials. We'd have a social. And just we'd pick a theme and they would tell, like, what's Christmas or whatever? Tell stories. And the songs we did were all in their language, and people would just come there and laugh. Our people like laughing, laugh and eat and sing and joke, and so it was a different theme every time. And then we our language classes for beginners, and then more happy to say some were able to move to intermediate. And during COVID, we went online and we went virtual, so it wouldn't stop. And. Uh, we would apply to our CEO for us to attend the language conference in Michigan, Sioux, Michigan. And we met people like Marianne Corbier for the first time and Alan Corbier, like just leaving a reserve to go with like-minded people. So many more resources we were exposed to that we could purchase there and people. And we know we brought Alan to our community after to talk about language. So the, I think they're really important to get out there and not be shy and collaborate with those and bring these things home because we're you get kind of isolated in your own little life in your own community when you bring in people it revitalizes you and they realize that everybody else is learning language out there we should be too and we really advocated for language and we now have um seven language teachers in our school boards from here my son is one of them and my daughter is the other one because you influence people. And now they're in the school boards teaching language and, and they're looking for more student, more teachers. So I was really supporting them and we had teachers, um, language teacher groups where we would have to, you know, to get to advocate for them and share resources and things like that. So it's just doing everything you can. And we asked our chief and council to put a template for our committee minutes and put it in the language and Every time we have use have um, we would ask them. Every time you just have anybody coming, can we use the language in there? Make sure it's a speaker that does the welcoming. So little changes, and if you come now, you'll see all the signs here are are bilingual. Our language and the English second second language, and the Constitution placed the our our um, Nipissing dialect as first language. So starting those simple things makes big changes and it gets more people. You have to go and just wake up, nudge your fluent speakers to help you because we can't do without them. And we offered them honorarium, advocated for honorarium, got them together and did things. And I'm really happy to say it's still going after all these years. And just that that's one of the most things I'm passionate about is our language retention.
when they talk about the great law, right? They talk about the great law of peace and they talk about peace, power, and a good mind. And within that, where they talk about power, uh, part of that power is unity. So um, I'm not a speaker. I will fumble my way through those words. Skana, which is peace. Kasat stong salah, which is power or unity. And um, um Kahnikolio, a good mind. So in that middle one, um Kasat Stong Salah, they talk about like unity, but unity being being of one mind, being of having the same um united purpose and and the focus of that purpose is to maintain peace. And peace is a very difficult thing to maintain because it's easy for us as individuals for our mind to go off and say, you know, oh, did you see that? Or did you hear what they said? And did you see the way they looked at me? Or whatever little thoughts go through your mind. So if it's like a constant thing that we're um, working towards, it is a, a joint effort because they also talk about um how we greet each other in the language and it's like you know do you have the peace are you carrying the peace so we always are checking in with each other or or uh, historically um we would be checking in with each other to make sure that those things were first and foremost in our mind now because our languages have been displaced with english you know we say hello hello how are you we don't even really know if there's a lot of thought put into those words or even to the answers right so uh unity is something that um you can't have that village model of lifestyle without being united in your goals on the news the media will really pick up on things like um blocking a road stopping um clear-cut logging stopping pipelines all this kind of thing and they, they always show the most kind of like violent or they portray it as being very violent but for myself, when I when I present stories and, and talk about um, our teachings and, and stories to the best of my ability, that I really try to reinforce that everything that we do, whether it's breathing, uh, the breath that Creator gave us, whether it is sharing those stories, beading, sharing artwork, all of those things that they try to, uh, the images that they try to deprive us from, that when I do that, I might not have a sign and I might not be outside walking around on the pavement or anything like that, but this is definitely a protest. When we share those things that they try to deprive from our future generations, it is every much, every bit as much a protest as if I was helping to block a road. And I think it has to um, be understood by our mainstream treaty partners that, um, we can protest in different ways, and this is how I choose to protest. Well, there's lots of ways our community experiences joy. Um, we are a close, close community, and we have wonderful get-togethers and um, at the library, we'd bring people together for author visits, and people just love that. Um, when we had Richard Wagamis, we couldn't fit hardly anybody else from the community into the library, and they were so happy to hear from him. And then we have everybody is always invo involved in our powwows, getting that together, and that brings everybody joy, and it's uh, held off of the island at the Sutton High School, which used to host a powwow every year, too, for their, um, their native students used to host a powwow. So now we go there and, uh, you know, do a powwow there. Our powwow is held there. And, you know, on Aboriginal Day, everybody gets together we have a little parade on the island and the kids are all excited and they have uh, the best decorated bicycles and stuff, you know, just not big, a big parade, but it's a really cute parade. And uh, we listen to drumming and we have uh, one of our uh, band members, he gets together every Wednesday night and he, they, him and his drum group drum outside the community center, but I'm up the road from the community center and I can hear them and it, it brings joy and uh, such a warm feeling 
to my heart listening to that. And I'm thinking, I wonder if the whole island can hear that because it carries over the water, the, the drumming. And another way I know the library helped bring joy was we were the hub, like Glenna was saying earlier. We were the hub of the community. We always had, people always knew they were welcome in our library and they loved to come. And we would all sit around and laugh and joke. We always had tea. We always had food. So people would knew they could come to the library, sit and have a tea, something to eat. And it helped people that maybe didn't have a lot at home. So that hub within our library was such a joy. It was a joy for my colleague Lynn and I to have all the people there and know that the, how comfortable they felt and all the joy that we would have. We would do beading and just talking and it was a wonderful time. And it did bring joy to everybody that was involved in coming to the library. Just coming to the library brought a lot of people joy. I think joy comes with um, uh, moving away from that fear, right? So when we grew up, there was an RCMP bear rcmp barracks right in our community uh the mohawk institute the mush hole was still open um so all of those kinds of things were very normalized because they it was just the way it was and if you even tried to question it like you know why why is the mush hole there why it, it was like you were silenced because everyone was so indoctrinated with not questioning these things uh, so i think that's that can be part of it but it's such a big concept when you come from an oppressed community because no one defines what oppression is. No one says, because your family comes from the reserve and you move out to the farms in the summertime and work for farmers who are not indigenous and yet they own hundreds of acres of farmland that you work on, um, and but you don't question that because it's like wait a minute as indigenous people shouldn't this all be our, our land so when you question those things you can you get the pushback from oppression right and it's like you can't ask questions like that why would you ask that and so you're just quiet about it so now the younger people aren't growing up with those same kinds of uh kind of like icons in their life um, there's definitely the residue that they're dealing with in the uh, what they call uh, intergenerational trauma. Um, but there also has to be intergenerational healing from those things too. And so part of it is that they do ask the questions. They do say things like, um, um, uh, for instance, we in our community, uh, they always talk about the Haldeman Tract and how the Haldeman Tract was kind of like given to Indigenous people to live on. And it's like, so we grew up thinking that and we're like, okay. Um, but at some point you start thinking, wait a minute, did that guy from England actually have the right to designate where our people had the right to live? And so they start thinking outside of those little uh, messages that they were given growing up and it's like thinking outside the track and going wait hold on we have to really push back on some of this stuff because actually land rights are protected in the treaties the treaties that have been conveniently hidden and and forgotten about and almost like evaporated from anyone's memory so when our young people are, are stronger and healthier and they have the facts to back them up and they have um, all of the knowledge or they're, they're regaining the knowledge, even strengthening our languages. Uh, it's really, in, um, that's joy. <laughs> that's joy. That And that's unity, right? And that's those things again. Um, it's, it's having a healthy mind and having a healthy body, not having that deprivation of food safety and, and traditional food safety, especially having that um, compassion for each other and that that unity um all of the combination of those things could really uh start um start or make you not make you but put you in a position to really experience that joy again um because i think with that comes like freedom from oppression right our community is a fishing and hunting community being involved in trades and all that all the all our since time began I find our people are happy when they're on, around the lake. 
in it, on it, you know, um, there's boats going all the time and the kids are happy. Some kids that never got to go out in the lake, we brought them up for their first time and brought them on boats. And Joy was just watching their faces and they're looking, they can't believe what they're seeing. They didn't want to fish, they want to swim, you know. And I noticed another thing that brings people joy here is their children. When their children are safe and happy and there's things for them, it trickles up to everybody being happy. When you see good things for the better future for the children and and activities and things, I find it just comes up for, to, for everybody, even to the oldest person. If our children are happy, everybody's happy. And uh, as Evan, I, I, I'm a I'm a people watcher. So when I go to play, I, I always look for the responses because that's what I get. I get high on that. <laughs> I get just seeing people watching the babies when they have the uh, Indigenous Day on the 21st and they, they come out there, the grand entry, the daycare. You just see it. You just see it. If you can capture the expression, it's joy. Watching our little people, future leaders leading us out. Like them those things so i think the children in the lake and being of the, the the land we have it brings a lot of joy that if we start losing our land like through the past it, people were unhappy when you start gaining it back it's, the happiness comes back